So hello and welcome to our lecture video on virtue ethics. So in this lecture video, we will be discussing the Greek tradition, specifically Plato and Aristotle, with regard to their contribution to ethical thought. Our focus of the focus of our discussion is usually Aristotle. Um, he has he has more contributions to ethics than any other of the Greek philosophers. Well, Plato has some contributions, and we will discuss it later, but we'll try to focus more on Aristotle. So Aristotle was born in 385 BC and died in 323 BC. So he's the third generation of the three great philosophers of Athens, the first being Socrates, the second being Plato, and he's the third. Now, um, Aristotle has, was a student of Plato, while Plato was a student of Socrates, but we all so have this question whether Socrates was a real person because <clears throat> there's this debate um, saying that Socrates was only a character in the Platonic Dialogues, meaning um, Soc Socrates was not a real person. He was just a character created by Plato in order to express his uh, philosophical thought through the use of dialogue. Now, Aristotle as a teacher was the tutor to Alexander the Great, um, one of the great conquerors of the ancient world. And he is also considered as the father of the following disciplines, ethics, which is our course. You also have biology. If you have taken biology or general sciences in your high school, this might have been discussed with you for introducing the method of taxonomy or the classification of species. You also have politics and government. Um, one of his works, um, The Politics, uh, compares the constitutions of Athens, Sparta, and the other Greek city-states. And this was the introduction of what we call as comparative politics as a discipline. And then you also have logic. Um, his contributions to logic are the traditional square of opposition and um, how to spot fallacies, for example. You also have rhetoric, which is the art of speech, how to convince people, and then economics. So one of the central questions by Aristotle is, what is the good life? Okay. Um, when you read the Nicomachean Ethics, this is um, his work on ethics as well as in politics, which is also dedicated somehow to ethics. Um, he always asks the question, what is the good life? Because this is the goal of our life right? To live a good life. But what's the good life? For him, it's one lived with eudaimonia. So eudaimonia is roughly translated as happiness and flourishing. Okay. So we go back to the notion of eudaimonia from Plato, the teacher of Aristotle. So one of the thoughts of Plato is this, happiness or well-being or eudaimonia is the highest aim of moral thought and conduct. So all whatever we do as moral beings, it is geared towards happiness, okay? So whether it's deciding to get married or to do this or to take this or to take an opportunity, the goal there always is happiness. But you have to have the requisite skills and dispositions in order to achieve eudaimonia. And this is what we call the virtues, or in Greek, this is what we call as avete. Avete is roughly translated as excellence. Okay, so these are the skills and dispositions that one needs in order to achieve eudaimonia. Now, Plato is also controversial for introducing the concept of the tripartite constitution of the soul. So what's the tripartite constitution of the soul? Plato says that our souls are composed of three distinct parts, the logisticon, the thymoides, and the epi epithematicon. Okay, gulula <laughs> ko The logisticon rules reason. So this is the head part, the body. The thymoides or the spirits regulates emotions such as anger. So this is uh, centered here in the heart or in the chest. The epithymeticon is centered in the stomach because it regulates appetites and desires. And Plato says that whatever is the dominant um, constitution of the soul determines your conduct and determines your place in society. This is what makes it controversial. 
Now, those whose logisticon is predominant or reason are destined to serve the state as rulers. That's why Plato has this idea that only philosophers should be kings. Philosophers meaning wise men or learned men because their logic, their reason is predominant. The second one is that those whose thymoides are predominant or the emotions such as anger and temper should become soldiers because you don't need weak warriors, right? You need to have brave warriors in order to have a successful defense of your city. And then those whose epithemeticon are predominant should be merchants and laborers. The desire to sell, for example, the desire to produce more goods or to do more services, okay? This is also connected with the appetite. So this is one of the controversies of Plato because whatever is predominant in your soul would determine your place in society. And this is also how he um, defends Athenian slavery. So one of the quotes here from the Dialogue Borgia says, Nature herself intimates that it is just for the better to have more than the worse, the more powerful than the weaker. And in many ways, she shows among men as well as among animals and indeed among whole cities and races that justice consists in the superior ruling over and having more than the inferior. So Plato says that... Um, in society, there are certain people who are naturally weaker, okay? They might not be blessed with intelligence, the logisticon. They might not be um, fortunate to be brave enough to defend their country, so they're not fit to be soldiers. And they do not have the desire to produce things, for example. So this makes them slaves, okay? So it is not so much a choice, it's more of a disposition of the soul. So those who are those who tend, for example, towards menial work or manual labor, ito yung tinatawag nating manual labor, diba? Um, they tend to be slaves. And you might ask, what is the predominant um, aspect of the soul? For Plato, he says that the soul is half developed for them. Okay? The strongest parts are the limbs, meaning the arms and the legs because that is what you need for manual labor. So that what makes um, Plato controversial. But remember, class, that slavery was a social institution at the time, okay? But, of course, um, we might look at it from a historical perspective, okay? So don't cancel Plato or Aristotle for this one. I know canceling is so um, popular right now, but we cannot cancel Plato and Aristotle just because of these views. In fact, Aristotle has these views that women, for example, are not fully formed human beings. Okay, But again, we cannot cancel them because they are a product of their times. Okay. <laughs> so let's go back to eudaimonia. So... Aristotle has an extensive discussion of what eudaimonia is. So for him, happiness or eudaimonia is the ultimate end or goal of humans. Because of all the goals in life, well, this is true, happiness is the only one which is self-sufficient. Meaning when you are happy, you are contented, it makes li your life complete. Wala nang kulang. Tama? Um, sabi nga nila, wala ka nang hahanap ng iba. And then second, happiness is final. It's always desired for its own sake. It, and it's never desired for the sake of something else. So for example, why do you want to graduate in college? Because you want to work. Why do you want to work? Because you want to buy the things that you want. Why do you want to buy the things that you want? Because eventually, it will increase your happiness, for example. Why do you like this person so much? Because he or she makes you happy. Okay, so... The ultimate goal of our actions is really to get happiness. So this is a very valid observation from Aristotle. And then finally, happiness is attainable. How do we attain happiness? And that is now the question of his discussion. So let's look at his 
at one of his fundamental works, what we called what we call as the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I have a copy of this book posted in Canvas. So if you want to read it, you can. We can do a reading of it if you want. Um, it's the fundamental Aristotelian text on ethics. So it's named after his son, si Nicomachus, who was said to be the editor of his works. Okay, And the emphasis of the Nicomachean ethics is virtue ethics and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, so it's divided into two. We have the pursuit of happiness, which is what which is what we were discussing a few seconds earlier, eudaimonia, and th then you have virtue ethics, which is the heart or the ethical framework um, associated with Aristotle. So again, let's go back to the definition of virtue. So virtue or avete in Greek means excellence. So According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it's an excellent trait of character. It's a disposition well entrenched in its possessor, meaning you all of us possess it. All of us possess it. The question is, how do we develop it? Okay, so this is how Aristotle answers now the question of the relationship between virtue, disposition, and the achievement of eudaimonia. Okay. And then we also classify virtue as either moral virtues, which is practical and relational, meaning you have to, in order to become virtuous on this side, you have to practice it with another person, or intellectual virtues, which requires the use of reason. Intellectual virtues meaning you can develop it by yourself. But for moral virtues, you have to develop it with another person through practice. So, how do we acquire virtue? Okay, so Aristotle answers this question by saying that we acquire virtue by habituation. Okay, like I said earlier, it's a constant practice. Okay, it's a constant practice. So, it means that what we repeatedly do, we become. Okay, what we repeatedly do, we become. And again, for moral virtues, um, in order to become virtuous, right? In order to become virtuous, you have to do it with other persons as well. Because, for example, if you want to practice, let's say, honesty, honesty, technically speaking, you can be honest with yourself, but the real test of honesty is being honest with other people, right? So one honest man does, ah, does not make a person an honest man. So, for example, may napulot kang wallet, diba? Pulot kang wallet. Um, may mga ID, nandun yung ATM cards ng tao, um, may 20 pesos. Mm -hmm. Dahil mayroon siyang ID doon na ibalik mo. Does that make you honest? In that instance, you are honest. But the real test of honesty is, for example, what if you are asked to administer a fund worth, let's say, a million pesos for a business? Sabihin sa inyo mga iare, uh, oh, here's 1 million pesos, bahala ka kung paano mo gagastusin. Basta kailangan, ito yung return of investment natin, for example. So that's the real test of honesty. E sabihin natin, kailangan mong gumastos ng pera. Kasi nasiraan ka ng bahay, or may nagkasakit sa pamilya, or whatever. Ngayon, kapag kumupit ka doon, kahit isang libo, then you are not being honest. ba? Not being honest. One act of killing does not make a man a murderer. This is the other sense of the term. If murder is committed repeatedly by one institution or by one person, then that makes him or her a murderer. But of course, there are um, complications with it with this as well because uh, there's a legal definition for murder. Okay. So one of the concepts introduced by Aristotle is what we call as the golden mean. Okay. So in the golden mean, moral virtues are character traits which lie between in between two extreme forms of these traits, the excessive and the deficient forms. So for example, with regard to the feeling of confidence, the mean is courage, the excess is rash, and the deficiency is cowardice. With regard to giving and taking of money, the mean is liberality, pagiging magastos, 
uh, liberality meaning pagiging uh, matipid pala, sorry. The excess is prodigality, pagiging magastos, and the deficiency is meanness, pagiging koripot. And with, with regard to honor and dishonor, the mean is proper pride, meaning self-confidence. The excess is empty vanity, kaartehan, and the deficiency is undue humility. Or masyado mong dinadown yung sarili mo. Okay. So, we have to remember that there is no mean for an excess or a deficiency. For instance, there is no mean for greed or cowardice. Because these are negative virtues. Meaning, there is no good that will come out of it. And then, um, the mean also is not absolute. So, it's relative to an individual in circumstance. For example, um, what is courageous may vary from one person to another or from one circumstance or another. Um, for example, in terms of courage, it's a different form of courage when you conquer your fear of needles in terms of vaccination. Tama? <laughs> As someone who is also afraid of needles, mm -hmm. I have conquered three injections already, two for COVID and one for flu. And it's also a different kind of courage when you are stressed, for example, but you agree to face head-on a challenge. So those are different forms of courage, okay? So let's look at this table of the golden mean. So this is Aristotle's concept of the golden mean. So we have here the deficiency, the balance, and the excess. So the mean between cowardice, pagiging duwag, and the rashness, pagiging masyadong matapang at palaban, is courage. Um, the deficiency between stinginess or miserliness and extravagance is generosity. The deficiency of sloth, the excess is greed, the balance is ambition, and so on and so forth. So just look at the table, and this is the application of the golden mean. Again, when we talk about the golden mean, it depends on the circumstances. Okay? So it's not always it's not always that we do the balance, actually. Sometimes we can go to deficiency. Sometimes we can go to the excess. But it depends on the circumstances, for example, or what the situation calls for. Okay. So there ends my lecture video on Aristotle. So I'll see you in the next lecture video with regard to the non-Western views on virtue ethics.